Welcome to Speed Up Python with Concurrency. My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide. In this course, you'll learn what the different types of concurrency are, how to use some of the standard libraries in Python that cover concurrency, including threading, async I.O., and multiprocessing, and when to use which kinds of concurrency and when possibly to avoid it altogether. Before I get started, a quick note on versions. This course is an update to one originally recorded in 2020. Python is always improving and new things in concurrency have come about. The code that I demo inside of this course was tested with Python 3.14. I'll be demoing some kinds of concurrency by fetching things from the web. For that, you'll need requests. I used 2.32.5 and AIO HTTP where I used 3.12.15. Speaking of hitting the web, depending on your Python installation, typically, by default, web certificates are not installed. As most websites redirect to HTTPS nowadays, you'll need to make sure that your certs are there. Your Python installation includes a script called installcertificates.command, which does this installation for you. Although you don't have to use the version of Python I'm using, the async IO library in particular has changed a fair amount over the years. So if you're using an older version of Python, you should stick with at least 3.8 if you're playing around with async IO. So just what is concurrency? It's the simple act of doing multiple things at the same time inside of your computer. For the moment, just consider a single processor computer. It wasn't that long ago that these were very common in the household. It would be easy to think that a single processor computer was actually doing multiple things at a time, but it wasn't. This was an illusion. Think of it like a film in a film projector. The projector is showing you multiple frames per second, switching between these frames quickly, providing the illusion of motion. A single processor computer is doing the same thing. And by switching back and forth between processes, it looks like it's doing more than one thing at a time. A lot of computing workloads are I.O. bound. That means they're waiting for the disk or network. Because a lot of programs spend a lot of time waiting, your operating system can take advantage of this and switch back and forth between the programs, providing the illusion that multiple programs are running simultaneously, when in reality, a single CPU can only do one thing at a time. Of course, nowadays, multiple processor computers have become cheap enough that they're pretty common at home, and so you can get real concurrency by running on more than one processor at a time. This course talks about the differences between creating concurrency in I.O. bound situations versus processor bound situations, and the techniques involved in solving both of these kinds of problems. Python provides several mechanisms in the standard library for concurrency, threading, async I.O., and multiprocessing. Threading and async I.O. are two different mechanisms for handling I.O. bound computing. Multiprocessing is actually how to use multiple processors. When solving I.O. bound computing problems, you use the first two. When solving CPU bound problems, you use the third one. One thing to be aware of when dealing with concurrency in Python is the GIL, or Global Interpreter Lock. This is a locking mechanism that makes sure memory access is safe inside of the CPython interpreter. As of Python 3.14, work is actively ongoing to get rid of it, but the GIL is still there for now and can get in your way. To delve into I.O. bound concurrency, you first need to understand latency and processing, so I'll be talking about that next. In the previous section, I gave an overview of the course. In this section, I'm going to talk about latency and how that leads into I.O. bound concurrency. Consider the basic parts of a computer. This is an oversimplification, but good enough for the level of our discourse. There's a CPU where the math is done. This is the brain of the computer. This is where the actual computation happens. Memory stores what is being worked on, and the CPU works with memory frequently, not only to find out what instruction to run next, but where it stores the data to work on. Memory is generally volatile and is gone once you turn the computer off. So for longer term storage, there's usually a device like a hard drive. And then finally, there is some set of peripherals. Peripherals are usually used for input and output. This includes things like network cards, video cards, and external devices like keyboards and mice. In order for a program to run, the CPU must first fetch it from storage. The CPU sends an instruction down to the hard drive, asks for some data, and gets it back. That information is pulled into the CPU. The CPU then sends that off to memory. 
In modern computers, there are ways of skipping the CPU to do this, which speed things up. But for the purposes of this conversation, I'm going to keep things simple. Once the program's been loaded in memory, the CPU needs to get the next instruction from the memory and run that instruction inside of the CPU. That instruction often impacts peripherals, for example, sending something out onto the network. The CPU sends information down to the peripheral card, and then the peripheral card itself sends information to the outside world. Each one of these components runs at different speeds, and this is where latency comes into effect. Consider the lowly nanosecond. That's one one billionth of a second. To give you a sense of pace, a Intel i7 can run about 100 instructions in one nanosecond. This varies from computer to computer, but on the nanosecond scale, you're talking about 10 to 100 instructions is pretty typical for a PC. Now multiply that out by 100. That's about how long it takes to talk to main memory. So every time the CPU needs to talk to the memory, you need to delay by about 100 nanoseconds. Again, modern computers have ways of speeding this up like L2 caches, but for the purposes of what I'm talking about, let's keep it simple. Taking those 100 nanoseconds and grouping together 10 of them gives you a microsecond, or 1000 nanoseconds. That's about how long it takes to read 500 kilobytes from memory. A short program. Multiplying that out by 100, and then by 10 again, gives you a millisecond. One millisecond is 1,000 microseconds. It takes about two milliseconds for a disk to seek. So when you ask the hard drive to look for something, if the read head is not on that position right now, it takes about two milliseconds for the read head to be repositioned. 150 milliseconds is about the ping time from the east coast of the United States to Europe. So that's a packet going out across the Atlantic and coming back. There's a huge difference in scale between the instruction level, memory level, disk level, and peripheral level in your computer. There can be a factor of a thousand or more between different steps in this stack. To try and put this in perspective, let's think about this like a distance. Think about a single CPU instruction as a meter or about a yard. For the purposes of this analogy, they're about the same. To help you visualize, that's about the height of a doorknob off the ground on a regular door. This runs in 0.01 nanoseconds. In one nanosecond, you can run 100 CPU instructions of that Intel i7 that I mentioned earlier. That would be 100 meters, or about 100 yards, which is roughly the length of an American football field, or about the length of a soccer pitch, give or take the same thing, plus or minus a few meters. So that memory reference, which takes 100 nanoseconds, that's 10 kilometers, or 6 miles. That's a quarter of a marathon. The best marathoners in the world can run that in about half an hour. Three microseconds, which is about how long it takes to read one megabyte from memory, is 300 kilometers, or 186 miles. That's three times the length of the Suez Canal. So now you're looking at large distances on the face of the Earth. Going from memory to disk just makes that worse. Reading one megabyte from disk is 82,500 kilometers, or 51,000 miles. That's over twice the Earth's circumference. That read time is only if the disk's head is in the correct position and the megabyte being read is in order on the disk, i.e. it's sequential information. If the head needs to move around, there's a cost to do just that. It takes about 2 milliseconds to do a disk seek. That's 200,000 kilometers, 125,000 miles, or about half the distance between the Earth and the Moon on average. And that ping time to Europe, 150 milliseconds, well, that's 15 million kilometers, or 10 million miles, that's one-tenth the distance to the sun. The difference between a single instruction and a simple network call is an astronomical amount. These differences are huge and hard to wrap your head around. Let me try it another way to see if I can just hit it home. Pretend that instead of an instruction taking fractions of a nanosecond, it took a full second. Reading that megabyte from RAM would take 2 hours and 47 minutes, or you can run 10,000 instructions in that time. That pesky disk seek, 6 years and 4 months, or 200 million instructions. A seek and reading a megabyte, 8 years, 11 months, just shy of 9 years, 285 million instructions. 
And that ping time to Europe, 475 years, eight months, or 15 billion instructions. The gaps between the levels in the computing stack are phenomenally large. And just to make it that much more complicated, that Intel i7 that I said runs 100 instructions, yeah, that's an old processor. The modern ones are about three or four times that. Unfortunately, for the distances and latency, it's easier from a physics standpoint to increase the speed of CPU than it is to increase the speed of network traffic. As a result, computer processors are getting faster and faster at a higher degree than the network traffic is getting faster. As CPUs get better and better, the latency difference between performing an instruction and going out to the network is getting more extreme, not less. This is why most programs are I.O. bound. If you write a program that first accesses RAM, hundreds of instructions could be run in the time that it's waiting. If it needs to access disk, that can be tens of thousands or millions of instructions before the program is ready to run again. And if you have to access the network, it's billions of instructions. This pattern is very common. In all likelihood, your program is I.O. bound. It spends more time waiting than it does computing. Next up, I'll talk about the types of concurrency and how to take advantage of this latency. In the previous lesson, I talked about the degrees of latency in the different components of your computer. In this lesson, I'm going to show you how that's taken advantage of to create concurrency. Recall this diagram from the previous lesson. It's common for a program to have to wait long periods of time for it to be able to do the next instruction. It needs to wait on RAM disk, and network. Time slicing is the idea of the operating system mixing other programs into these wait states. While you're waiting for that network packet to come back from prog, the computer can insert multiple other programs to take advantage of that time. This time slicing is how a single processor computer can look like it's doing multiple things at the same time. Time slicing for multitasking can be thought of at three levels. The lowest level is not having any at all. The olden days of personal computers, the DOS operating system worked this way. You could only run a single program at a time. Cooperative multitasking is when the program willingly gives up the CPU. If you know that you're about to go out to the network and you're not going to need the CPU for a while, you signal the operating system and the operating system can schedule a different program. In home computing, Windows 3.1 introduced this kind of multitasking. If you happen to be old enough to remember using this operating system, you may recall that at certain times the program would just stop refreshing. That would be because it didn't give up the CPU, but it was stuck in a wait state. So the UI was not being updated because the program had not told the operating system to put it into the wait state. As the name implies, cooperative multitasking requires all of the processes to cooperate with each other. In shared computing, or in the case of a program with a problem, this can be a challenge. So preemptive multitasking was created. The operating system in this case interrupts the program whether or not it's ready. The operating system is responsible for swapping between the different programs. In most operating systems, this is done intelligently. If your program does do a network call, that triggers the operating system to take advantage of it and put the program into a wait state but it can also do it in the case where the program's being a hog and hasn't given up the CPU. Mainframes have done this from very early on, as has Unix. In the Windows world, NT and Windows 95 is where preemptive multitasking was first introduced. On larger computers, you can have this time slicing as well as multiple processors. On each CPU, you can now have different programs running. In some cases, the same program may also be resident on those different CPUs. In this diagram, programs 1, 4, and 5 are tied to a single CPU, but programs 2 and 3 are across the two CPUs. Part of the operating system's responsibility is scheduling within the CPU and across the CPUs. Not all types of software can take advantage of concurrency equally. The type of concurrency you have can change what kinds of models you would use when creating a concurrent program. Trivial concurrency is that where the different parts of the program can be split apart without concerns for each other. 
This can usually be achieved when activities within the program are completely independent of each other. This is easiest if there's no shared data between the different components. Consider a web server. You can have multiple clients talking to the web server at a time because each one of those clients don't need to be able to talk to each other. There may be some contention at the disk level, but as you saw in the lesson on latency, a huge amount of processing can be done while a server's waiting for the disk. In the non-trivial case, you have to share data across your concurrent components. When you're thinking about this situation, it's useful to think of three steps in processing, input, computing, and output. Concurrency is generally done by splitting up the compute portion, but that may mean that there's coordination necessary for the input and output stages. You may also need coordination amongst the different compute nodes, depending on what kind of algorithm you are running. Using the input, compute, and output model, you can think of programs in three parts. A producer is a component that produces data. This might mean reading something off the disk. The worker is the component that does the actual computation. And the consumer is the component that consumes the data or aggregates the output. Consider for a moment doing some image processing on a very large file. The producer portion of your program would read the large image format. The worker portion of your program would do the actual filtering on the image. And the consumer component would consume the result from the worker and write the new image to the hard drive. Depending on the architecture of your program, these concepts might be mixed and matched. Using these three ideas, you can introduce different patterns in concurrency. This simple pattern has a producer pushing data to a worker, which pushes data to a consumer. It might not be immediately evident where you can get concurrency here, but because producers and consumers are interacting with the disk, a lot of work can be done in the worker while producers and consumers are working independently. Thinking back to the image processing example, the producer might read thousands of bytes off the disk, hand them off to the worker. The worker could then manipulate those thousands of bytes, creating a result, which the consumer would then write to the disk. Unless the worker is particularly computationally intensive, in all likelihood, it will most of the time be waiting for the producer and consumer. But as soon as the worker has been fed data, it can start working. The producer does not have to have read the entire image off of the disk. This can produce some concurrency. A variation on this pattern uses multiple workers. Your producer reads information off of the disk, hands it off to a worker, which begins computation. The producer then reads more information off to the disk and hands it off to a second or third worker. The workers work independently, creating a result, and then the consumer is responsible for writing it back to disk. This pattern is common with the processing of very large images. For the most part, an image can be broken up into components and image processing can be done on those components independently. This means the workers don't have to talk to each other very often, giving a high degree of parallelism between the work they are performing. A variation on this pattern is for the producer to broadcast. In this case, each worker sees all of the data. It may not operate on all of the data, but as the data is exposed to it, it can continue to work. These patterns can also be mixed and matched. You can have your producers broadcasting to workers, workers talking to other workers, and those workers consolidating information for the consumer. Next up, the challenges that concurrency introduces and how it's changing in Python as we speak. 